Well, let's get going then. Um, good evening. Welcome to the 25th of October meeting of the uh, working group, Act 65 working group of the Racial Disparities Advisory Panel. Um, let's begin with introductions. Robin, why don't you go first? Good evening, I'm Robin from Crime Research Group. Uh, that was a little broken up. Oh, is this any better? Oh, that's much better. Okay, yeah, I could have just been hoarse. I was, um, prior to that, uh, there was a dog involved. Um, yeah, Robin oh. from Crime Research Group, and the dog's name is Tessie. Great, thank you. Welcome to both yeah. of you. Uh, <laughs> Abigail Crocker. Hi, I'm Abby Crocker. I'm from the University of Vermont and the National Center on Restorative Justice. Great. Susanna. Hi, Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. Great. Ian. Uh, hi, uh, Ian Morris, Aton's uh, note taker. Great. Thank you. Karen. Hi, everyone. Karen Gannett from Crime Research Group. Representative Christie. Kevin Coach Christie from Hartford, Vermont. Thank you. Evan. Evan Meenan from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Good evening. Great. Elizabeth. Elizabeth Morris from the Department for Children and Families. And I, oh my God, and here's someone who is a guest and I, Mark, is that you? I'm blind tonight. No? Oh, dear Lord. All right, let me go back. Uh, Representative Lalonde. Martin Lalonde and uh, Representative from South Burlington on the House Judiciary Committee. Great, thank you. Uh, Sam? I'm sorry, I may, I'm probably misreading it, but these words are very small and I left my glasses at home. You are a guest. Welcome. Oh, I feel, can anyone else read that? To me, it looks like Saima, Saima. Okay, guest. I mean, I can only see an S. Yeah, we are really regretting re butchering your name, and it's my fault because I don't have my readers. Saima, S A I M A. Got it. Thank you. I'm very sorry. I can't see a thing. Julio. <laughs> yes. I just joined. Yes. Good yes. evening. Introduce yourself, please. Okay, I missed that part because I just logged on, so I just got it. Hi, I'm I'm Julio Thompson. I'm an assistant attorney general and director of the attorney general civil rights unit. Thank you. And hopefully, oh, I'm to some now. <laughs> Rebecca. Rebecca Turner from the Office of Defender General. Thank you, and Monica. Hi, everyone. I'm Monica Weber. I'm with the Department of Corrections, and um, I'm going to turn my camera off briefly to do something else, but I'll be paying attention. Okay. Anyone that I have forgotten or just unforgivably butchered, please speak up now. Okay, great. Uh, this evening, the representatives have a couple of remarks that they would like to start the meeting with. And so without any more preamble, I'm going to turn the meeting over to the two of them to speak with us. Representatives, floor is yours. Uh, I guess I will start because uh, Coach pointed to me. And, and, yeah. and always follow his lead, including 
uh, being told to lead. Any event, uh, so this is more, it's kind of like a managing of expectations somewhat on one of the decisions that uh, were put before uh, the RDAP that I understand completely that you're not going to be able to uh, uh, get to, uh, and that is where uh, the Bureau should be stood up, uh, where it should be located. And um, Coach and Aton and I have talked about this a bit, and, and I believe we have a, a, a way forward, uh, but I just want you know, to give a little bit of background. So if, if we were to uh, present to the Government Operations Committee, which is the committee that would be, uh, really needs to weigh in on this, uh, in uh, creating a, uh, an entity within, uh, within state government, they, they have primary jurisdiction. You know, there are, are parts that judiciary will definitely handle, but, there's, but uh, they will be a very a key part of this. Uh, if we if we put to them, uh, well, here are a choice of uh, three different locations that you could put this, and uh, you figure it out, GovOps. Um, that would that would most likely tank this for next year, and the reason for that is that they're going to have somewhat limited capacity. They they are going to be dealing with uh, redistricting, which happens every ten years and takes significant time and effort uh, from that particular committee. Uh, and they also have some other very large uh, issues that they're going to be taking, uh, uh, addressing such as uh, pensions as well falls within that committee. So what we really want to try to do, and that's when I say we, that's uh, Representative Christie and I, we want to have this, um, the, the terminology, it's very technical terminology, pre-baked as much as possible uh, when it arrives at the Government Operations uh, Committee. Uh, and that means that uh, 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 Coach and I are going to uh, make our decision of, given the input that you all have given us, of where we think uh, this uh, entity should be placed and really looking at it uh, out of a really political expediency. What, where can we put this that we can have the best chance of getting this through uh, next year, next session. Um, we don't work in perfection in the legislature. Uh, you may have all noticed that already, frankly. Uh, but we feel that you know, if a lot of the work that you're doing on the details that RDAP is doing on the details is, is great work and we want to see that move forward. And I think the best way to have that move forward is that, that we figure uh, we actually have in a bill where we think this should uh, be located uh, and and in the entity that we think will allow us the best chance to get it through. Uh, and down the road, you know, next biennium, if, if we want to tweak this, that frequently happens and we can improve it then if necessary. So where we're probably going to be landing, if we haven't fully landed there already, is to suggest that it, uh, that it goes to the uh, director of racial equity in, in that office um, or potentially the agency of digital services. But I think you all have suggested the uh, director of racial equity, although I believe uh, making it into a department, which that would also be a much heavier lift. Uh, so we would, we would think of just putting it uh, under the uh, auspices of the director. Uh, so we would love to have um, input on that, possibly if you are able to give that kind of, uh, can give support or input on such a decision in, in your ultimate report. But I don't think it's critical uh, that you do so. Uh, I think it's more critical that you are getting this other great work done. Uh, but we did want to share that just as far as managing expectations because we don't want all of a sudden folks to think that, oh, well, we've ignored what the RDAP has said. Well, we're not because you haven't said anything necessarily on that particular issue except some options. Uh, and but it, it really I think we need to we need to put something in the bill that we're going to get introduced uh, as far as where this is going to go. It makes most sense uh, that it goes uh, in the uh, racial uh, equity director's office. 
Uh, so that's kind of where we are. I'm happy to answer questions, but I uh, will kind of turn it over to Representative Christie if he has anything to add. Well, not to be redundant, uh, you know, I think Mark uh, pretty much summed up the uh, uh, the thinking. Uh, I know in a lot of the discussions that we had when we were talking about doing this work, uh, I went back to some of the notes uh, from uh, earlier RDAP meetings and recommendations uh, around data uh, and the housing of data. And there seemed to be a, a fairly high uh, uh, leaning you know, towards uh, the Office of uh, uh, Racial Equity. And just from a historical perspective, when the office was originally created and it's enacting legislation, uh, you know, prior to uh, striking uh, that particular language, that's where it was going to be. Uh, and actually, I think there's, there's a, a, a subset uh, of information still in the enacting legislation that talks to uh, uh, data specifics uh, around a number of the uh, areas that we're referring to, uh, but a more global uh, perspective around data. So anyways, that's that's the thinking. Uh, moving Moving things in the legislature, like Martin said at the beginning, it isn't a perfect science, uh, and sometimes it's a question of how do we, uh, what's the path of least resistance to get things started, to be very candid. But I really, really appreciate all of the work and the great thought uh, that's gone into this, uh, because that's what makes it work at the end of the day. So uh, kudos to RDAP and the working group. And thank you. Do people have questions or comments that they want to? I, I, I can imagine a lot, actually. Um, Evan. I figured I might as well go first. Uh, yeah. but, and, but, but I will go first by saying that uh, I do appreciate the, the sort of that, that preliminary feedback and, and managing our expectations. I do think that that's helpful information to have heading into the session. And, um, you know, I, I hope that I have, have done an okay job of expressing the position that there are very, that, that all three of the entities that we have suggested can likely get this work done successfully. Um, at least that's what I would anticipate expressing on behalf of the department. But I would likely also um, just like to take a minute to to respond briefly to the to the idea that if if the office of the director of racial equity is assigned this task. The idea that that it wouldn't be that it might not be possible to elevate that office to a department, and I I do appreciate that in the realities of the legislative session, but I would I, I would ask that at, at a minimum, if it's if that is the home and it's not possible to elevate it to a department level position, please keep in mind the the staffing resources that we've identified, because um, this oh, is yeah. potentially a very big task. And as I think Representative Christie already identified, the Office of, of the Director of Racial Equity already has some, some data collection responsibilities assigned to it. But I, I imagine those responsibilities would be very difficult to fulfill without some additional personnel and resources. And so um, I, I would just like you to please keep that in mind as, as you head into the session and have deliberations on this topic and whatever recommendations RDAP comes out with. Yeah, just I think uh, certainly our intention is not to have this be a so-called unfunded mandate foisted on uh, the office, uh, that we're looking at the recommendations of what kind of resources are needed for this, uh, but just where do we place those resources? So I appreciate that input, though. Thanks, Evan. 
And and just uh, one other uh, you know piece to this. I, I I'll call it a parallel universe. In the sense that there is existing legislation, you know, right now that talks about creating uh, or moving the uh, Office of Racial Equity, you know, into uh, its own uh, uh, universe, uh, so to speak, or department uh, status. Um, and so, and that's been that's been ongoing. Uh, because that was part of the original legislation, uh, that it would only be working from the administration, but it would be totally uh, um, uh, separate. Um, and that was part of the reason that it, the bill got vetoed uh, initially, and we had to uh, <clears throat> you know, come back and uh, resolve the veto uh, by leaving it in the administration uh, unencumbered, so to speak. So there's that that little that you're not little uh, <laughs> that part of the <laughs> lift uh, that's part of the discussion as well. Evan. Anyone else? Rebecca. Um, absorbing uh, your messaging of uh, representatives uh, tonight and some clarification questions come to mind. I'm hearing that it's a heavy lift to change much, any is the question of the current uh, Office of the Director of Racial Equity. I guess that's the question. Yes, I'm not. I'm not sure I understand the question. If you mean, um, I think the the idea would be the the work that's being done on the, uh, the makeup of the of the bureau and uh, what its charges and the resources towards it and all the other details. Are all packaged together, and and it is just that it's housed uh, in the uh, director's office in the uh, office of racial equity. Um, so I guess that I'm not sure if that answers the question. I, I, but I, I I maybe I've not been as in tune to why the concept that it has to be a department at this point. I mean, it'd be preferable, uh, but I think the main point is to get all the is to get the necessary resources uh, as set forth by the RDAP that we're going to be seeing in the report and finding the place that we can put it that we have the highest likelihood of success of actually getting it through uh, and also makes a lot of sense given what uh, also what uh, Representative Christie has been saying about about uh, the origin of, of that office. I'm not sure if I'm really addressing your question, Rebecca. But. No, thanks. And, and you are, and, and I'll, I'll give you, sorry, I should have provided a little more context. There has been considerable discussion and concern um, amongst the members of the subcommittee as to the placement that, that you're proposing now, which is um, within the director of, of, of racial equity's office. Um, and I know we're calling it an office, but it's, it's, a, a place of one, and I hear you talking about expanding it. The concerns, however, have been not that it's the an obvious fit because of the mandate itself of addressing racism. I mean, that is clear. Like it, it's clear that that is an obvious uh, seeming fit, along with Human uh, Rights Commission and along similar lines, right? Uh, but. At the topmost concern, and this is where the concerns of that director have come out, is is ensuring that that this data entity uh, have independence um, is insulated from uh, political partisanship, that it be protected to ensure the integrity of its work, uh, with independence, so that we can trust the information um, and work that, that that entity produces. And so the concern is, is that to have that embedded within the agency administration 
we don't have those kinds of assurances. So when I ask about whether or not uh, there is move ability to provide some additional um, protections to insulate that office uh, from political pressures. Uh, again, Representative Christie, you're talking about sort of the precursor and what happened post veto and, and sort of the, the movement to pull it out of the agency administration and make it a standalone office in and of itself would be fantastic, right? A dedicated office of racial equity for the state and the executive branch. But again, that's back to the question to you, which is what is, because to me, that is the key, how, you know, my my instinct, and, and of course, I'd go back and, and consult with the Defender General, but her primary concern is that in, in coming up with this data entity, that it have the integrity and impartiality and not be seen as a political tool to advance a certain agenda. Uh, otherwise, we may as well, perhaps it's better to wait until we have that uh, ability or support to, to do it right the first time. And I worry that if we create something to get it started, we entrench it um, in a certain direction. So those are those are my concerns just out of the gate. You're on mute, uh, Coach. Sorry about that. Uh, I guess I'll I'll just share. Uh, as we all know, a lot of legislative action uh, doesn't start out the way we hoped that it would start. Uh, but it's a question of uh, being resolute, you know, in continuing the work. You know, we have not stopped one moment in being very clear. And you notice I, my tone has changed a little bit uh, <laughs> as far as emphasizing, you know, the fact that we will continue to push, you know, for the independence of that, you know, of that office. And you know, sometimes it's a question of, you know, when do you have enough votes to really make it happen? You know, if and I'll, I'll be specific. A veto proof majority could very well put us in a position when the bill hits that cycle. To move it forward. And, and and that's you know that's the rest of this the, the story uh to be very candid you know with you rebecca because we share we share that same concern you know that's why we started the, the conversation that way and we really haven't given up that fight because we consider it a fight you know and uh it's one worth uh continuing the effort uh, so your point is very well taken uh and we would hope that uh at least as long as we uh, have the uh, intestinal fortitude to keep up the the fight, we will continue to work in that direction. Thank you. Okay, Rebecca, do you have a follow up or anything that you want or? No, I just want to share the uh, feeling of enormous pressure to hold up the uh, community members. Uh, positions here and they're not present um, on this call. I don't think I see any here, um, but just to stress again that from our prior reports, the dominant theme that we believe should be the, the, um, the guiding principle to any new data entity to be different, to be useful, to make sure that the people who are the data behind the, you know, the, the reporting, that they're protected, that it's not to be used as a sword against them after all of this, um, has been one of, of ensuring independence. And, and I know we've unpackaged that further throughout the summer of what that means, right? We're not, not a standalone entity necessarily. And, and we were working towards not necessarily, as, as, as you've heard, we haven't been able to commit to a, a single entity, uh, but we have seemingly come around to seem like Perhaps a consensus as to as to the underlying principles, and certainly those oh. those were it. Um, and so I wonder what your messaging leaves us in terms of how we should um, go forward with recommendations, because I can't help but feel like it is 
um, asking us to compromise the very heart of it. But perhaps I, I'm here. I'm welcome. I want to, you know, if others to share their thoughts on this. Okay. I have one. Um, coming from a variety of directions, I was in a quote unquote, I guess it was called the discussion, although it was being taped on YouTube with a couple of um, legislators who said that they could not vote for this body because it was simply about the criminal and juvenile justice systems when there is a need in their view, and, and you have many of us, to have data from education, from housing, from welfare, from any number of government entities. Um, there were a fair number of them, and, on, and some of them on the relevant committee uh, coevally there have been discussions here about, well, subsequently, really, there have been discussions here about whether it is about social justice or it's about racial justice alone. The idea of the scalability of the uh, proposed entity was to allow for it to be about social justice in general so that it would be possible to look at gender, it would be possible to look at sexual orientation, all these categories that certainly exist that we don't necessarily have data for. Um, I certainly know that there has been a lot of feeling from many quarters that the Office of the Executive Director of Racial Equity is really too narrow, and that if you take the word racial out, it, it, it gets more to sort of what everyone's hope, maybe utopian, is. If, in fact, this becomes a uh, organ, I guess, in the office of the executive director of racial equity, are we then just entrenching that we are going to call it racial equity and that's that? because you're gonna have a fight with some of your colleagues, representatives. And um, I have to say, there's not agreement here. I mean, there are some people who are for it. I know Sheila is not for calling it social justice. Right. She really wants it to be about race. Yep. I really don't. Um, so there's not agreement, um, but, I'm just curious as to whether this placement then affects that uh, hope and terminology. You, you want to give that a shot, uh, Martin? I, I have a thought, but why don't you go ahead and start? No, go ahead, Coach. Well, just thinking in terms of, uh, you know, naming, you know, we, we had the same, um, situation when we uh, uh, formulated uh, the Social Equity Caucus. Uh, and, you know, we, we've been able to approach a lot of discussions that affect Vermonters, disenfranchised Vermonters across the spectrum. Um, you know, we worked with Outright Vermont to get their uh, money back into the budget uh, and accomplished that. Uh, a number, you know, I, I won't, you know, delineate the list, but a number of the activities that speak exactly to what you were talking about. And I know it's kind of utopian, but at the same, you know, at the same sense, if we we're not a monolith, you know, and 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 that's what we run into so many times with colleagues, allies, and friends doing this work. 
you know there there are those differences of opinion i think if we can come to uh, a consensus so to speak as to a good uh jumping off point uh that protects those those disenfranchised vermonters that could very easily become even stronger allies then that's a good thing you know so so my, my personal feeling would be uh utilizing you know the social uh justice you know peace even though it's housed in the office of of racial equity is a is a factor of let's say us you know continuing to put the um not pressure but being uh vo voices for protecting you know as many vermonters as possible you know so i i, I guess that's you know my thinking initially with what you were sharing. Okay, thank you. Other voices. Jeff, and it is good to see you, sir. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, there's a difference here that I'm seeing, and I want to be dissuaded of it, of sh the difference between sharing the data and being co-opted to a larger tent, which in the history of my 70 some odd years has happened repeatedly over and over again. There's nothing to exclude anybody from looking at data as we compile it. That's not the name of the committee that I became a member of. And I've seen this happen from the beginning of my life. Come into the big tent, come into the big tent. And you know who gets left out in the end in the big tent? Take a guess. Take from Carrie Nelson and Nation and the vote right on up. And somebody's going to have to dissuade me of that because I don't buy it. I don't buy it. I don't buy it that we don't, that we can't share the data that we collect that we can join other people on our own. But um, I've seen it too much. I've seen it too much from the battles in the civil rights movement till all of a sudden it became anti-war and it was women rights and everything and everybody got everything except for the black folks and the Hispanic folks. And uh, I know I sound like a radical, but I. I've seen the movie and I'm totally against the movie. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Rebecca. One of the things that I, I have been thinking about is how could we legislate, how could there be draft legislation to insulate um, the work of the data entity wherever it's housed? Um, and we've we started looking, you know, I've been pulled in uh, some legislation, we, we worked through it, um, you know, in there is sort of highlighted the selection process, the selection process of, and I think in this case, it would translate to the permanent staff, for instance, that we're proposing who selects the permanent staff, who can hire, who can hire, who can fire, right? Um, as I understand the current setup of the director of racial equities, uh, it's a position that you, know, you serve at the pleasure of the governor. So could there be, if that were to be the place where this is headed for real, for most likely chance of passing out a session this year, this coming year, would there be the ability to change that, to insulate it, to ensure that, for instance, the selection process include the input from 
and then pull in from what we think and, and what Jeffrey just was talking about, the direct voices of people who've been outside and excluded from in the tent, right? So, you know, not just for input of the selection process of people of color, people with lived experiences. We've talked about that a lot, right? Um, there is, at least in the public defender statute, uh, the the example of requiring that not just that the governor you know selects the defender general, but uh, also with the uh, I think what's the language acceptance consent of the Senate, right? Again, sort of a build-in check. Uh, so we have that sort of process. I wonder if that's a possibility to change to insulate. There is also um, sort of a protection of of independence to to. Um, how to fund, how to contract, right? How to choose appropriate services outside of the entity. Um, again, consistent with uh, the, the, the budget set by the General Assembly, right? Consistent with certain standards. Again, looking to, I was just rereading the public defender statute and how that has built in a lot of, of, of insulating language. Again, these are, questions back at you, which which sort of I'm, I'm curious to hear your input in terms of those types of of ways we can strengthen the office. Let's assume, you know, what you're talking about is the direction this is headed, but is is there political will to do something like that? I mean, I, I, I don't have any answers right off the top of my head of what would work, but we can certainly work with our legislative council to see what might be done to, as you say, insulate the office and see what kind of ideas, and we can look at the Defender General statute and look at some other ideas as well. I mean, I'm not opposed to trying to put something in there to assure uh, independence. Uh, so happy to look at that. I just don't know what that would look like at this point. Just, just a quick uh, comment. Um, you know, we have changed things in a very short period of time. If you look at the presence actually of Susanna's office in RDAP, you know, we we changed that language so that she's here formally. We also added additional members to RDAP that were selected by that office. Um, so, I guess I'm not afraid, you know, to try to navigate that water. And possibly one of the things that we might, uh, you know, look towards uh, are those those uh, statutory changes that make sense that give us that protection and and what. For example, the point that you brought up about uh, the uh, uh, consent of the Senate. Uh, we need to go back and take a look at that, um, you know, that language and where it's, it could be inserted. Uh, but that's an amendable, um, you know, piece, you know, to the legislation too. You know, it's it's chipping away at it you know i i know it's it's not you know the immediate uh piece or it might not be the the total piece that we're looking at for independence but we're sending a clear signal that we're building uh a ladder to get to it because as i said before we're not going to stop trying to separate that but it'll it'll probably happen inc incrementally you know so Anyways. Evan. Um, so I, I was just sort of thinking about where we might go from here um, and what the what the ramifications of this, the expectation management that we now have might be on our final report. And um, I thought it would be well, I thought I should just throw out there that I, I while I while I do appreciate the expectation management as as previously stated, and and still think all those st stand by all those statements, 
I, I thought I would add that I still think the direction that we were headed in the report is the is the appropriate direction. Um, you know, I, I still think that it's it's reasonable for for this group, based on the information that we've been able to obtain and discuss, to recommend various um, homes for this entity, so that we can do things like flag the need for independence that Rebecca correctly mentioned. We talked about multiple times, and then and then also I think that another aspect of the direction that we're heading in is still beneficial. I mean, we were given the specific charge to address a Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics. Now, we did talk about scope and the ability to grow and expand, and I do think it's important to note those things in our report, but we were still tasked with just a, a, a an entity that, that was specific to racial justice statistics. So I think it's, I think it's okay to to answer the immediate question before us, which was focused on racial disparities, while noting that we shouldn't we shouldn't ignore the fact that we might have similar questions related to de other demographics in the future, and there should be capacity to grow if that need arises. So I still feel pretty good about the work that we've done and the and the direction that we're heading. Haven't we done that? Yeah, exactly. I, that's why I think we're yeah. we're doing good. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll see. That's the thing. We're we're not talking about not, um, or, or or let's say not changing any of your recommendations. Okay. We're we're just sharing a pathway, so to speak, because one of the things that will happen, hopefully, God willing, um is that we will be taking testimony, you know, from, you know, RDAP and RDAP members, you know, as to um, their positions, you know, around, you know, the whole conceptual idea. And, and it's not like, you know, you know, Jeffrey's going to have a chance to share, you know, basically with the committee of jurisdiction, you know, his thoughts and feelings and his concerns you know rebecca will uh Eitan, you know evan you know the, the, the folks that have been directly involved in this in this process will have that opportunity to share and then like we have to do in in all of our policy work it's a question of filtering you know and and listening and trying to come up with something that you know, we'll, you know, get across the finish line, so to speak. Monica. Thanks, Eitan. And um, yeah, I've been listening and trying to um, figure out, like Evan, sort of, well, what, what does it mean for the report, right? Understanding that this is the direction that, you know, we think, um, it will take in the legislature. Um, and then listening to Rebecca's suggestion. And I think, you know, if since we know or believe that, you know, the office, the racial equity director will be re receiving the data entity, we could tighten up some of the language to add some of the recommendations that Rebecca made, right? Um, so that it's, it's in the report, it's clear, it's not something that necessarily you know, has to come up in testimony, but it comes from the whole committee. Um, and there may be some other things in, that we would want to change in the report itself without taking out the opportunity, the proposal that there still could be other places um, for the data entity to right. be housed. But I think it might help us sort of shape and tighten up things and make a couple other additional recommendations um, that we've talked about tonight. If that's making sense. Mm -hmm. I have to share something that I shared when I, I don't remember. I feel like I spent last winter testifying. God only knows to whom I was speaking. Um, when Trump came into office, transgender people had one world that they had come to understand and to be able to move in in certain ways. 
And one of those ways was they were that allowed to serve without shame, without hiding in the military. Whatever else you may think of that man, he came into office and with the stroke of a pen, that went away. And I would just like to point out how many times in the history of discrimination in the United States of America, rights of people are taken away with the stroke of a pen. And I have to say, as much as I want to be a 19th century Whig and go, well, it's real politic, and that's what we have to play right now, there is something in my black, queer, neurodivergent, and Jewish gut that says, I don't think so. Not until somebody can assure me that some person who would rather see me wiped off the face of the bloody planet can't pick up a pen in a decade or the next time some wave of so-called populism washes over us and writes me out. And I would be pissed on a more humorous note that we just spent, I did take a vacation this summer to write this damned thing. And not so that some white man can write it out a decade hence, as I say, when the next wave of populism comes through. Sorry, that was not a very chant chair sort of expression, but that was a time the community member. I mean, I don't agree with Jeff in many ways, except Jeff's right. <laughs> Jeff's totally right. I mean, he's, I can't argue with him. He's absolutely right. I just don't agree with that. But that's possibly because I'm, I don't know, dumb. I don't know. I, but he's right. Mm -hmm. Things get, people get written out of stuff all the time. I mean, transgender people didn't have a clue about what to do after that. I mean, the number of petitions that littered my inbox about, I, I, Suicides went up by 15%. It wasn't just a notional moment. People died. I said this to the legislature. I, 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 I just... It is hard to be a person from historically stigmatized communities and believe in the goodwill of people in power. We have learned that is unwise. And everything in my body is in war right now. I want to be, if y'all don't know 19th century Whigs, they kind of were really into real politics. They were like, what can really be done? Let's not be utopian. And there's a part of me that is absolutely like that. And there's another part of me that watched my transgendered friends. And it was ugly. And I know we live in Vermont and we, we've got this Vermont exceptionalism thing going. I love it. Nothing that happens in the rest of the United States happens in Vermont. Water flows uphill in Vermont. Did you all know that? The sky is green in Vermont because it's Vermont. I mean, all these things that just happen in Vermont because it's Vermont. I'm sorry. I, last time I checked, they were humans living in the United States. And I am frightened. I'll shut up. 
I would, you know, we have been so long overdue for this project, as we all know, for it, that there is this, we're so close, right? And there is, I understand the pressure to get it out, something out and seeing what we can get out next session. But I am also very much at a place where I'm reacting the same way as Aton and Jeffrey. I appreciate how dangerous data can be when it is used as a political tool against the most vulnerable people who have been just dis, you know disadvantaged. And I and I see it from um, both a professional experience level representing um, people who are the least powerful to protect themselves in these very powerful systems. And, and also personally, again, um, my perspective uh, on, you know, as, as a biracial, uh, you know, Filipino mother, uh, daughter of an immigrant from the Philippines, it is also very personal. And, and oftentimes when we talk about data and in and, and Vermont being, you know, we talk about it in black and white terms, um, I, I am channeling Chief Stevens in terms of feeling like, you know, there are so many communities just rendered invisible, um, just how we're thinking about it. And there is so, so much of an opportunity and need here in Vermont to just get us somewhere better than where we are now and understanding these issues compared to where other states are at. And I understand that, which is why I have been motivated to work really hard this summer as well. And Aitan, I, I feel you, like we have spent so much time. Um, and Monica and Evan, I think, I, you know, in terms of thinking about where we are, we're, we're close, we've worked together on this on this report and, and perhaps that is it. We're, we're headed in the right and same the direction where maybe there's, maybe that's what we need to do next is where we want to take the, you know, hearing what, what the chances are for next session, how we want to adjust and what type of specific language, um, if any, we can pull from other examples in the statutory scheme or, or other general principles of what we're hoping could be used. But ultimately, I don't know if I can get into support of something sort of as a halfway measure. I just think it is very dangerous um, and very sensitive to how things can easily get entrenched um, in a government system. Anyone else? So I, I would just want to make one comment as well that, um, yeah, we will. So Coach and I are, you know, we're, we're dealing, <laughs> we would like to, to have it exactly as the RDAP uh, may be coming out uh, and recommending it. And, um, it would be delightful if we could spend more time and figuring out and diving deeper into three different options of where it could be. But we're just faced with this reality. We're faced with the reality that redistricting is going to take up this particular committee's significant time, and 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 uh, they're going to have very limited capacity. Um, but we would also like to keep the momentum going that we've been building over the last couple of years uh, since the Social Equity Caucus came into being and we've really been able to focus on these issues. And we also, at least, you know, we understand we're in an, a very imperfect world of getting things done uh, where things are done incrementally, but particularly difficult in Vermont where we have a citizen legislature with very limited staff availability and we're there for five months and, and that's why we have to kick some of these deep dives like you guys have been doing for us you know uh, into groups like you um but but at the end of the day you know we still have a pretty significant amount of work that we would need to have the legislature do to look at three different options or there's a lot of significant work if you want to I mean, I hate to, yeah, you know, I'll throw this out there. I mean, do we want to extend the time that this group is working and and come back and say this is where this should be and exactly how it should be stood up? You know, I I'm afraid of doing it that way for a couple of reasons. Number one, we've already really been putting a lot of uh, burden on on your shoulders that you know certainly. And number two is again, I believe we have some momentum that we've been building. 
to try to get some of these things done. Um, but you know, you all can certainly discuss, you know, how if it's worth proceeding uh, with choosing a path uh, that we think that we have the best chance of getting this next step done. Susanna. I just wanted to respond to the representative's last question about whether uh, an extension of time is appropriate. And I would say that I am somebody who is who feels very strongly that uh, time extensions are usually always very helpful. I respect that the legislature acts with a sense of urgency, and yet sometimes things just take longer. So I wouldn't be opposed to seeking more time. However, I'm not sure that our quandary here is a matter of rush. I mean, that certainly plays into it, but I think really it's just about government structure and what we're comfortable conceding. Maybe that's the wrong word, but I think we're all just stuck about a state government that functions, but that may not be laid out how each of us thinks is ideal. And we're creating new entities now and trying to place them in existing or new places and nothing quite feels like it fits right. And there's there's a German word for this, uh, Zugzwang, where it, in chess, where all of the moves are bad moves. And so I know you probably thought that I was going to comment on whether or not I think it should go in the racial equity office, and I won't, because I have already, right? You've, you've all heard me say the same thing. Um, if you put it there, we'll get, we'll get it done. Uh, but you know, you've heard me say I think that it's a natural fit for a racial equity office. But I don't think that the racial equity office is necessarily a a great fit for AOA. And on top of that, um, the concerns about independence are fair. Um, you know, the current principle we have, I don't have any qualms about this admin. But we're not making decisions for this admin or for the people who are currently um, on the board. To continue the chess analogy, we're making decisions for whoever could be in place, and so these are uh, fine questions to ask. And then, of course, there is the matter of scope. And I've heard all of you speak very passionately about why it should or should not be limited to race. I'm somebody who thinks that there are a lot of identities and protected categories that we should be doing deep deep dives about, and that. It's appropriate to collect these sorts of data about more than just race. And I'm also very sympathetic to the fact that this is a racial disparities um, panel and that this is the specific charge that was given to us by the legislature. I, you know, I, I also have to acknowledge that if we if we put this in the racial equity, I said I wasn't going to comment about it. If we put this in the racial equity office, um, then necessarily we are creating a much heavier lean for that office towards criminal justice. That 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 becomes its major focus just by virtue of person power and scope and resourcing. And so that's another question about you know just a, a philosophical question in state government. Do we do we really think that that is where the majority of resources should go for a racial equity office to criminal justice matters? And the answer might be yes, the answer might not be, but those are just some things to think about. So as usual, I have given no answers, just more questions. Thank you for listening. Anyone else? Uh, Evan. Uh, I just wanted to chime in on the bit about uh, more time for this exercise. And it's not that I haven't enjoyed spending my Monday evenings with you. Ah. I think that you're, you've honestly all been, I mean, these meetings have been productive and, and in many ways a, uh, a pleasure. It, they've been, it's been a good group to be a part of, but, um, and I don't know if we're headed in this direction, but I'm not sure that I would be a proponent of asking for more time in for this group in our report. Um, I still do think that our report is headed in the right direction. And if there was a conversation that needed to be have uh, once the legislature reconvenes about more time, 
I think this group could certainly spend more time um, evaluating these issues, but I'm also mindful that that there may be a need to do a fiscal analysis of these of the potential homes for these for this entity. And that to my knowledge, I don't think that we could ask the joint fiscal office to do that. I don't I don't think we can do that, but I might be wrong about that. But if there was a, a group that consisted of a mixture of legislators that wanted to explore this, would they be able to tap some of those more traditionally legislative resources and, and continue this work after the session if that need actually did arise? So maybe this is more of a question rather than a comment, but I should, so I should probably rephrase it. But if, if, if we couldn't get it done this spring and, we, and more work needed to be done over the summer, would we want it to be this group or would we want it to be some sort of group of, of legislators that's tasked with, uh, with answering some of the remaining questions that we haven't answered? I don't know. I'm throw just throwing that, out, that question out there for folks to marinate on. Julio. Yeah, I, I, I think I may be repeating some of what's been said, but I think a couple of things might be might be new. So that's that's about me and me to put the hand up. Um, you know, I, I've I've worked with a lot of governments outside of Vermont that have undertaken massive data collection and analysis processes, and uh, I've never seen any and and for people who have thrown in more money than I think the state of Vermont is likely to do. And I've never seen one amass a lot of usable data within the first year or even the first two or three years. Um, so if wherever this department is established, if it was established today by the uh, 2023 legislative session, I doubt very much you'd have a pile of, of data that you could really use very well. Um, because this this state is uh, very diffuse in terms of its record keeping. Uh, there are some data that's in a paper driven system that's not going to be accessible. Uh, there are going to be lots of issues to be negotiated. Um, so for me, I mean, really what what I was hearing from um, uh, the start of the meeting was really was, do you want do you want your department to sit on ice or or sit on the wall for a year? Or do you want to get it started under the Office of Racial Equity, which might be a possibility? Um, the, you know, some of the issues about independence, I hear them I, and I appreciate, appreciate them very much. Um, frankly, uh, back in 2018, 2019, people were saying that uh, the lack of insulation uh, related to the, uh, the Racial Equity uh, Commission and the Director of Racial Equity it was the same sort of issues, um, and uh, we have we have that position housed in the agency administration. And my experience from civil rights has been nothing but positive. Uh, and I don't, I, so I don't see it as a danger to put it in for a year. And I and I don't. My limited experience uh, with the legislature, it's only, I don't know, I don't know how many years, but it's not as much as some on, on the call here, but uh, the idea of it, once it's there, it has to stay there forever. Um, that's a fear, but I don't think that's an inevitability by any stretch, especially since I don't think after the first year that unit is going to be up and running and everyone's going to say, oh, it's working perfectly, leave it as it is. My guess is that a few months into it, everyone will realize that there wasn't enough money put into it, <laughs> that the task was bigger than people scoped out. Um, so, I mean, I just have, I have the same concerns. I just don't think they're, they're nearly to the degree that I'm hearing. And part of that really is born on the fact that that first year is gonna be a very slow year for those new professionals who are gonna be collecting that data. It is very time consuming and it can be very frustrating, but it um, the the portrait that I think that's going to emerge by the end of 2022, if the legislature does enact something in the session is going to be people realize you do need more resources and then you can have that argument about departments and about which three places in the legislature that 
they're going to be housed in. And um, and then we'll have that debate. I don't think this legislature, historically, when I think about issues that have been revisited and revisited, like the fair and impartial policing statute has been amended, I think, five times in five years. Uh, the uh, Because people have felt like the work wasn't complete, um, the Criminal Justice Council was reconstituted its membership by statute last year. Uh, so that there is much more community voice. We'll see how it works out. And I think it's likely if it if if it hasn't proven to be effective, there'll probably be another bill to tweak with that again. Um, so I'm not I'm not, you know, sitting here with rose colored glasses at the same time. Um, I think it is. Uh, Again, the fact that the you know the the opening act for this data collection, I think, is is not going to produce a lot of results. Uh, it, it's going to it's going to be the, a lot of groundwork uh, laying, and and I think that that to me that makes it less likely that it's going to be entrenched uh, and stay there forever. Uh, and I think there there'll be uh, a better time. Um, uh, I, I I don't I don't have any experience with the redistrict redistricting um, uh, process, but uh, that pension issue is a big issue, <laughs> and that's that's going to take a lot of time. And I think the the I appreciate the candor uh, which with this all starts because to me it sounds like you you basically are looking at a, a high possibility of it just sitting on the wall for a year. Uh, and that's not something that's very attractive to me. So uh, there I've heard some good ideas about things we we maybe we could suggest to build the, the additional protections maybe for the existing office uh, and, uh, and and maybe do it in a way so that you can even build in the legislation that there's going to, you know, it's going to be up for change or debate the following year. I mean, there are different types of sunsetting or timelines that can be built into legislation about where things are going to be housed or how they're going to be administered. So um, I, I guess I'm less worried um, than some of the other folks here. Doesn't mean I'm not not worried because nothing's certain in any legislature anywhere in this country, but um, but you know, I'm just less concerned, and I, I wanted to offer that perspective as well. Representatives, where are we in terms of uh, draft legislation? Because of course, we haven't been able to have um, anybody here because we can't have that. Um, where where does that sit? As the chair, I'm suddenly feeling a abdominal clench of terror. Go ahead. Uh, I, I I mean I have so so um, the legislature in drafting is largely first come first serve and getting requests into the queue, and I have gotten the request into the queue. Mm -hmm. um, but could I tell you exactly when I'm going to be able to have a legislative council working with me? Uh, no, they have to have everything ready to go by the end of December. I mean, that's when that's when bills have to be done. Uh, and and they know that this is coming. I'm keeping them uh, in the loop uh, as soon as they're ready, whether I have the report or not, I will start moving towards getting a draft uh, worked on. Uh, and, you know, I can watch or look at the preliminary reports and such, and that's all happening behind the scenes anyway, and it can be modified once the final report comes out and if there's significant differences or additions and whatnot, uh, we, can, we can accommodate that. Uh, so, yeah, I will look at, as soon as they're ready, I will look at where the work product is from this uh, group at that time. I know that in the legislation, it says that there's supposed to be draft legislation. Uh, it, it can be more high level conceptual. You know, it's, it's whatever you can uh, accomplish there. And again, there's no great fine or consequence, you know, if 
not everything is perfectly done in this report. Well, I mean, we've already talked about the fact that one of these questions cannot be answered by the time this report comes out. Uh, we put in there as far as wanting legislation, uh, you know, we try to put that into, or at least I've and, and, and Coach, uh, we've tried to put that into where we've had task forces and such because we believe that that eases the path to there actually being action. You know, if it's just a recommendation that comes out uh, or a report on something, it, it's it doesn't have as high of a probability of actually making it through. So that's kind of why we put that in there. But I don't think that's a concern here because this is a high priority uh, for uh, Coach and I. It's it's a high priority for leadership as well. Uh, so, you know. So I wouldn't worry that much about whether you are going to be able to draft this pristine legislation for us. Whatever you're able to get done with your folks is great. Uh, and as like I say, as soon as I, as soon as I uh, actually get uh, moving uh, with the legislative council, I'll look at the work product and and uh, we'll let you know uh, in case. Okay. Want to bring in a couple of your people to help me out with the legislative council as well. So. That was a long right. way to answer, but. No, thank you. I, I really wasn't certain, and I just suddenly was going, November 15th is no longer four months from now. So I <laughs> suddenly, <laughs> all right. Eto, uh, it, it, uh, we, we've done that before as well. You know, there's been, uh, I, I know, a number of different collaborations over time, uh, you know, with uh, Evan's predecessor and Rebecca and, you know, others yourself and, you know, in actually the the editing, you know, of language. Um, you know, some of the points that, you know, Julio made, you know, when we changed the uh, the group that has the most authority in policing, you know, the criminal justice, you know, council, you know, mm -hmm. that was, that was epic last session to get that done. You know, we increased the affected community's voice on that committee in, in a very large way. And, and a lot of that came from you guys. You know, the energy to do that came from here, you know, so it, I think we all experience, you know, what you shared and what Jeffrey shared and what Rebecca was talking about, because we live it, you know, we, we all live it in some sense of, you know, the but at the at the same time, you know, I, I have to go back, you know, to, you know, some of our colleagues and mentors and, you know, like, you know, uh, John Lewis talked about uh, things coming your way. You know, you have to be in the way in order to have them come your way. So the fact that we're, you know, not allowing it to hang on the wall <laughs> and we're moving in a in a hopeful positive direction you know is is something to be said you know as as well and and that's because of your work you know we wouldn't even be having the dis discussion if it wasn't for you guys you know at the end of the day and and it's you know what I one of the things I've learned in recovery uh, after a while is is that it's about progress, not perfection, you know, and, and that's what this is, is ultimately about. So, uh, oh, geez, I just outed myself, but anyways, uh, that's <laughs> okay. Enough pontificating, right? <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Um, thank you both representatives for this. Um, I, it certainly had to clearly 
uh, come up. And I'm really grateful. I think we all are that you came this evening and uh, gave us the information we needed to know. Whatever we may feel about it. <laughs> so um, thank you. Uh, are people comfortable? My other plan for the evening was literally to, I noticed to my delight that there were a lot of comments on the new and improved draft document. And I thought we should get really boring and go through them. Um, but I, if people are up for that, um, I would recommend we take about five minutes to just sort of switch gears and then come back to it. Is that acceptable? Just sort of nod or something, I mean. Okay, good. So it is currently basically 7.20, let's be back at uh, 7.25 and we will start in on the edits that you all have made. All right, 7.25, please. Thanks, Eitan and everyone. Thank you. Is everybody back? How do I know? How? I mean, what does that mean? Is everyone back? How do I know? I mean, we just start, we just start and people just, we just start and just start. yeah. So there Evan's were two cat is back. So that's the important part. Evan's cat is back and Evan's <laughs> cat is so cute. <laughs> oh my God. All right. I can't get distracted by cat. Um, her, her name is cricket. <laughs> oh God. Sorry. Now my, my cat moment is happening. Um, I, there were two ways of going about this that I could think of, and you guys may have others. I thought that each person who had commented could go sequentially through the document with each of their comments and talk about them, and we could discuss. The other way is to just go from this comment to the next comment, meaning from person A to person B, person C, whatever, back to A, what would people like to do? I think going by section and getting all the comments at once would be my By preference. section. All right, then let us begin with the introduction. Well, now the introduction is Act 65, which we can't argue about. Oh, no, but Evan did. What did I do? Let me... No, you didn't. Okay. No, just I'm sorry, him Evan. that the act name was actually. Oh, yes. Right. The an act relating to miscellaneous, something like that. I remember that. All right. So we need to fix that. I'm putting in will be fixed. Just so I know what's going on. Okay. Um, next, I'm going to need help guys. My eyes are really bad. I, I think this is, this is one of mine is, as well. I, I, it was, uh, yeah. it was two, two comments. The, the first was, I was more just a missing quotation mark. If we decide to keep this quote in, which is, you know, we can do that. Yeah. Um, but then the other one was, and it, and it's sort of, I guess I had a couple of comments about the references to the toolkit in general, because, you know, the average reader, even uh, even legislators might not know what that toolkit is or be familiar with it. And so I thought there were, there could be kind of like two approaches. One is we could just sort of keep all these very specific references to the AIS, AISB toolkit, um, um, which, but, but, we, but we still might need some more context just to sort of identify like what it is, where we got it, why it's important. Or the second, the second potential pro approach would still be to give a little bit of that context, like maybe two or three sentences, but, but then just sort of say what we like about the toolkit and, and just say it's, it's our expectation or desire, whatever word we want to use as the RDAP 
that this toolkit inform the bureau slash offices rulemaking and whatever other sort of procedures they put in place to do this data collection. And 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 I defer a little bit to to, to Karen and and Robin on that because they're they can probably translate the data collection and analysis components of the toolkit a little better than than I can. But I w so I was trying to flag that there might be two different ways to go about addressing the toolkit and how me we might want to do it, I guess, could depend upon how many specific references we want and then also how long we want this report to be. Um, so just kind of throwing that out there. Monica, you have your hand up. I just wanted to follow up with that because I did make a couple of similar comments throughout the document that um, it seemed like we didn't describe the toolkit when we needed to if we wanted to keep it um, so heavily referenced in the document. Um, but I but I also agree um, that we may just want to do an introduction and either you know put it in as an as an appendix or send or reference it. Um, because the whole thing is really important. Um, and when we start pulling so much out of it, I just feel like we're taking part of the toolkit and putting it into our report, um, particularly some of those sections at the end that took, you know, a couple pages of it. Um, so I don't want to discount the, you know, the toolkit. and I want to make sure that it gets referenced and used um, at the data entity, but I think that we just need to restructure it a little bit, how we reference it. What if there were a few sentences such as Evan suggested, and then if just the whole thing comes in as an appendix? Yeah, I like that idea and stressing the the importance of it and the the recommendation that the data entity really rely on that toolkit. And I think Karen, you mentioned something else just also about the AASP just general data integration and data sharing. I'm not sure if you made that comment, but I thought that was a good one too. I Darren, did you I make the comment because I thought the the data, I think it's data collection and integration document that's referred to in the ASP toolkit lays the foundation that um, Julio was talking about earlier. And I think that's a really important piece. Okay. Can I ask a favor, and that would be for someone who has the document open at the moment to please type this in, these corrections, because I really don't have my readers and it's turning into soup at the moment. Hey, John, it's Rebecca. Yes. I, I had my hand raised too, and I was just going to say I didn't get my um, changes up um, to it before this meeting, but I had along the same lines that Evan and Monica are saying here, thought that we needed additional language to stress the key points, which is a, make it explicit that we heavily relied upon this toolkit and that mm -hmm. we um, envision or hope that that future planning rely on this, continue to rely on this toolkit and, and agree on the appendix. So I, I actually put in some sample language in a, in a just now in the current uh, shared document version of some suggested language. Um, oh. in a yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. I think that goes. I should point out it goes a step further, which recommends that um, that there be direct consultation with the AISP. Um, again, that's reference. We made a comment a while ago that some other state agency, I think it was Department of Mental Health, was it Abby? Who, who directly yeah, directly um, consulted with AISP. And so I thought, oh, let's we could put it even in there, um, referencing that availability of extra help. Okay. Okay. And what I about just, the- I just I'm wanna sorry. make a caution, I just wanna make a cautionary note there, and maybe it needs to go in the document if you're gonna reference um, consulting with AISP, is that I think it's great to, to um, consult with them on the foundational information. Although I think we have Mo as a free, um, a person who can freely work with us. 
to um, look at the foundational information, but to make sure anybody that's consulting is very um, well versed in criminal justice data. Um, and I don't know if AISP are or not. I have not seen any reference to criminal justice data on their website, and I've looked for it. Um, so I would just make sure that if if someone's going to consult with them, we also have people that are well versed in the data in Vermont, criminal justice data in Vermont. Got it. And again, can someone note that, please? Because I can't see. It's just too small. Thank you, whoever. I can sort of see the names. <laughs> All right. I'll put it in. I'm talking, but I'm on mute. I'll I'll just add a short note. Thank you. That would be helpful. Um, we went through Evan, we went through Monica, Abigail Crocker. I think I, think I actually yeah. had one, yeah. one more in there. Um, you did? Where? But it, re it, yeah, it really is a pretty minor thing. It's, it, it's more of just a placeholder to remind ourselves that when we go back and do the final proofread, whatever name, we, whatever name we settle on for this entity. Um, right. Um, just to 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 make it consistent, because sometimes it's the Office of Racial and Social Justice Statistics. Sometimes it's the office. Right. And, you know, just to, it's just the final proofreading thing. That's all it was. Yeah. No. Of course. Of course. We're we're a few weeks from there yet, but yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yeah. Go for it. Someone was going to speak. Okay, maybe not. Um, we are now to what? I was <laughs> I just gonna. Hearing. I was just gonna. I know. I was just gonna go. I, if you want, if it's helpful, but if it's not, tell me. But if it's if it's helpful, I can I can pretty much see it, and I can sort of call them call the comments out if that's helpful. If you're having trouble that seeing would it, be helpful. Yes. Okay. Because I know we're up to Abigail Crocker. We are, and hers had to deal with that bullet point number five on the top of page four. It says, the comment says, perhaps expand to state the potential increased ease of sharing and access to administrative data across state entities within state government. I, I think I'll just comment on that. I think it's such an important point. Um, you know, in my own conversations with talking with um, AISP, and, and I know that it might not be on their website, but they do have a lot of um, experience working with justice data sets, um, uh, you know, in combination with other systems, which I think is one of the hopes of this group is that it could foundationally grow to incorporate like public health and stuff. Um, but one of the big messages that they shared was you know, when you talk about different levels of data sharing agreements, um, sharing sensitive data within state entities, keeping it behind that firewall of state government um, is a lot easier. So to me, coupled with the fact that state governments have sort of the overhead and the, this, the infrastructure that's mentioned in the previous points, to me, that was a big one here. Just that idea of the data sharing of administrative data across and within state um, entities is um, is much easier than with outside entities. Discussion. I'm comfortable with that that language change. Okay. Yeah, I mean we we would we would need it in order for the data to flow into the office. Great. Right, because we're like basically. <laughs> right, okay. Would someone like to write that in now? Um, Karen, do you want to continue to do the sort of note taking and I'll continue to do the reading? Does that, is that okay? Sure. And that one, sorry, before we move on, I think that one has language in there, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, and for what it's worth, that was, I, I agree. This is, this is a good point, Abby. Right. Um, the next comment was also mine. I, I 
proposed deleting a small clause at the end of the first sentence in section three, it, it wasn't because I found the language substantively objectionable. It was just uh, the sentence was getting kind of long. And I thought, is there a way to make it more readable? And that potential deletion stood out as maybe the easiest one to make. But if folks feel strongly about keeping it in, I, I was just trying no. to make this sentence a little shorter. Take it out. That's my vote. I can read that. It's big <laughs> enough. Um, oh, and then, yeah, then this is, you know, I hope this is a word choice question. The next comment is a word choice question in bullet point number one, whether we want to use the word govern, inform, oh, guide, direct, you know, pick, tomato, tomato, maybe, I don't know, but, um, you know, it was funny because I read it again because we got so stuck on this a few weeks ago and I read it again and, you know, the thing is, a word has a particular definition because of its context. When govern is used here, it does not mean the same thing as it means when we talk about the governing body or governance in general or I govern you. I mean, it, context plays an important part in definition. And so I don't really have a problem with govern here. And I actually like the strength of it, that the relationship should govern. I mean, it's more poetic. And I get that. But the thing that I like about poetry is nuance. So is that what, I mean, if, is, that, is that what we want to go with? I mean, ultimately, no, I mean, this is the- We can vote. Uh, we can vote. I'm, I'm going with govern. You all can do whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's- Fine. I, mean, I think govern I, works. You know, to add to the additional uh, <laughs> uh, options, there's also the proposal to use direct, um, which got some nods in the comments section on the side. I think okay, that you fine. Have, I, uh, either one, govern or direct for me is works. Direct is great. Love direct. All right. Excellent. Look at us making progress now. Um, okay, number three. Some um, so Ab Abigail, you suggested adding a number three to this list that said consider adding a new item to help clarify what all the subsequent data practices are. Referring to three, uh, it, it says develop a comprehensive data set, office data set, to understand, inform, and address disparities within state systems. The office data set should be built to include administrative data across state agencies and departments. I like it. Felt like it gave grounding to all this sort of subsequent data practice mm -hmm. references. Discussion? Does anyone what have is an it? objection? What? But like what is administ what is administrative data like as a subset of data? So I think that's one of the things that is I think inherently confusing throughout the document. Data is really anything you collect, information. But really, what the governing piece we're talking about here are the administrative data, things that are collected for operational purposes um, within state entities and. And so it's really like the data that's been outlined, what's in different specific data systems across these different, different organizations. So if you're bringing that administrative data together, um, that's really the governing data. That's what's owned by these different entities. So, so I think it's important to distinguish that because in other places we talk about different types of data. So this is really governing administrative data, which is owned by these different entities. And I just want to add there that Witchy had suggested in the document, I think it's either later on or in one of the, um, I think it's later on in this document that we actually define administrative data for the document. Oh, okay. good. I was just about to suggest that. Good. This is Robin. I have a comment on this current comment. Um, and that's well, just a kind of a, um, not disagreeing with it. Um, but just the way that that sometimes entities read these these reports or documents, we don't want one data set. 
Um, we want the office to be flexible in creating data sets that are relevant to the questions that the governing board asks. Um, mm -hmm. That one data set, you know, I think uh, Abby will agree, won't do it. You, you know, the, the questions, the data sets have to be continual and responsive to the questions that the governing committee asks. So delete. And I don't know where to put it in that. Um, and I don't know if this is the, you know, I'm just saying there needs to be more than one. I, I think just to be clear, I, I think that administ so I, I agree, so maybe administrative data sets, but also in future subsequent sections when we talk about what data will be prioritized and collected, I've added a few other comments um, that I think speak to that specifically around um, different levels like readily available data, not readily available, but existing and then non-existing and sort of that cyclical pattern that you're referring to because I totally agree. It's not, it's not one and it's also some of it doesn't exist yet. Right. Okay. Right. So can we take it in with sets be, set being made plural? And these yeah, issues I think that's, Yeah. Oh, okay. Go yeah, for I it. Wrote, I wrote some it. language in there, Aton. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, the next comment is on um, is, is also from Abigail and it relates to existing number four. The, uh, the existing number four says follow best practices on data sharing, integration, analysis, and reporting. Um, and Abigail's comment is would recommend including data collection in best practices, especially as there is a priority in supporting mixed methods work. Sure. Got it. Okay. Number five had dealt with um, assisting various entities to improve data collection. And Abigail recommended that it, um, that the various entities, we consider changing various entities to state agencies and departments, thus clarifying focus on using state administrative data systems. Also really appreciate this focus on improving data collection and reporting practices. Perhaps there is an opportunity to be more intentional in this domain throughout the document. And then she also suggested adding a sentence to number five that said, the legislature should be aware that entity, oh no, that was me, was that me? That was me. I did that because I'm trying to flag whenever I can. My department might need some help. OK, <laughs> we're open to the assistance. Well, I think I think that's true of all departments, Evan. I read that statement and I was OK. And I think that that's I think everyone's going to. And I, I've been saying that for a while, too, so I totally support that statement. We're, we're, I did recently learn that we might not be as bad as I thought we were, but I thought we were pretty bad. So. <laughs> so so it's a win might, for you guys. It's a win for us a little bit, but I just, I do want to try and manage expectations, but I, I do agree with Abigail's suggestions that it should be develop and improve because that might be important for some folks. And I also agree that changing various entities to state agencies and departments might be helpful as well. So just, on the sure. state agencies and departments, how about state agencies, departments, and their contractors? Yeah. Because think I'm thinking about... Be the um, all the uh, CJCs, the diversion programs, uh, you know, people who are collecting data and carrying out the functions of state government, but have a contract to do so and aren't tied into state government data systems. Yeah, I agree. And that was going to be my question. I was like, I was feeling like some of the data we will want in the future goes yeah, well beyond it's housing, the state. Yeah, yeah. It's housed elsewhere. Yeah. I like yeah. that. I like that. And I, you know, I think that the, my intention with looking at it was if somebody says assist various entities, you might have like a random group off the street who'd be like, cool, it's your job to assist me. And I just knew that would be out of scope. So this might help add clarity. Thank you. Although I, I you know, maybe not in this, Abby brings up, up a good point, um, uh, is that later down the road or somewhere, uh, um, the ability for this office to provide technical assistance to people who are community organizations who don't get state funding to collect data um, or to have that kind of, this is what you, you know, data 101, uh, to provide 
technical assistance consistent with the uh, toolkit to agencies at some point in time or to, okay. to community organizations might be helpful. All right, we have to put that in. Do you know where yet, Robin, or we haven't gotten there yet? I don't know where yet. That just was a thought that came to my mind about okay. technical assistance and people asking for it. We'll flag it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next comment, also from Abigail, related to number six. Number six said, currently says, identify the data that can be easily collected or that are already collected. And Abigail suggested changing that to identify existing state administrative data across agencies and departments for inclusion in the office data set. Develop strategy for accessing data that are readily available, i.e. in existing reports or extracts. Data that exists but may not be readily available, i.e. data in Excel spreadsheets. And data gaps where data do not currently exist. Where gaps exist, support agencies and departments and best practices to address. Sounds lovely to me. And very detailed. Discussion. It seems to me like it captures what we were trying to state, but exactly. in perhaps a more detailed manner. Exactly. Just, unless I'm misunderstanding something. <laughs> which... I think I think it does capture it. I also feel like we say that someplace else because the language sounds kind of familiar to me, and I don't know if it's later. And Karen, maybe you are thinking about it, but I feel like we say similar types of things later on, so just making sure that we um, might be consistent. Yeah, okay. we do. Actually, it's in the 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 data governance section down there. Okay. But I'll yeah. I'll take a look at that and make sure the language is similar. Yeah. Okay. By the way, I spoke with a few legislators over the weekend, and they were really funny. They said, "You know, some people have a thing about repetition. We don't." <laughs> Just thought I'd pass that along. Okay, keep going, but it Devin. Has to be the same. If what? you change it and it's not the same, then it's confusing. Yeah, then they freak out. So I'm just saying, make it. Let's make sure we make it the same. <laughs> well, it has to be like real <laughs> repetition. Yes. Right. <laughs> not All right. Similar. I'm going to keep ah. going, but I'm going to close. I'm going to turn off my camera for a minute because I have to go get my charger. But I can read and do that at the same time. So the next comment had to do with number seven. Right now. It says analyze the data, and Abigail suggested changing it to analyze the data included in the office data set. I like it, but I would say again, plural sets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then um, we had a new suggested number eight from Abigail, which reads, develop and establish data sharing agreements at multiple levels, including one, data sharing of non-sensitive data among state agencies and departments, two, data sharing of sensitive data among state agencies and departments, three, data sharing with external researchers and evaluators, uh, and four, public use data files. And she notes that each of these levels of data sharing are governed by different legal requirements and all serve unique and important functions. Okay, data people, <laughs> you're on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're gonna have to do it. So there, you, you can put it in, there's no way to do this without doing that. So you can put right. in, in exactly what they're going to be doing. Um, you know, a lot of these entities already have data sharing agreements. Um, so it's a question of how to modify some of those uh, data sharing agreements uh, to include this new office um, and, you know, exactly what that looks like and how the data are going to be transferred. So they're going to have to do it. It's part of the job. Got it. All right. Think, and just to add sort of the clarity of why I put it there was it, I think it really is clear that it's sort of four unique things, not just the generic data sharing. And specifically, um, you know, what drew me to it as the external researcher is 
Um, mm -hmm. I know how hard it is to put these in place with external researchers for each yeah. of the individual entities. So if they're going through this process, being a resource so researchers could go there instead of the individual entities would be great. Cool. Let us go, given that we've got this wonderful momentum going here, this is fun. Evan, are you there? Oh, there oh, I'm you here. are. I am here. Yeah. Evan, let's do one more and call it an evening. Okay. Um, on number nine, oh, number nine and Oh, number nine and ten. Um, yeah, my, that was my question. I wondered whether or not they were somewhat duplicative, or should number nine refer to the RDAP? What was I? I don't even know what I was thinking about that. Um, I think rather than like, spelling I, it all out. Oh, oh, yeah, maybe that. Yes. I yes. That oh, was that it. was it because 10 was nine. Yes. Okay. Sorry. So I was wondering, should 10, because 10 refers to reports of the advisory panel on racial disparities. I was pretty sure that was us, but then I <laughs> got confused. It's like, is there yeah, more than one our, of these? Okay. No, that's our real, that's our real title. Got it. That's our real title. We just say RDAP because it's more musical. Um, what was your question about this? <laughs> I, it, it seemed like nine and 10 were somewhat duplicative, but that could have been as a result of me not being quite as familiar with data collection. But if they're not duplicative, then my thought was, should number, ta should number 10 use the abbreviation RDAP? Because I, I was in guessing it was referring to us. Okay, sure. I guess, why not? And it does, I have to say, it feels like two different things because the report of, tw of December 2020 is different than these reports that may come about in the future that we are by statute required to produce biennially. Oh, I see. I think that was my confusion. I, I didn't realize that 10 was, I didn't realize that 10 was looking prospectively. Yes. Okay. That's, that's why I didn't understand it. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. Well, that was fun. Thank you all. I will bring my glasses next week. I don't know what I, I was late. I just ran out the door. Um, I want to continue this. I just want to, I want to keep going like this. Um, I think this is productive. I think we're getting a lot done. Um, I want to thank everybody for their comments. Um, I want to thank everybody for what was a very, um, a difficult discussion. I think when the representatives were here, that was hard, or at least I'll say it was hard for me. Um, it was hard for me. Um, if it was hard for the rest of you, thank you for being here and helping out with it. Um, and I hope we will see everyone next week. Abby, including you, because you've got like a lot to answer for. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm hoping we'll see everyone next week. Thanks so much for all of this. And I really do feel like this report is coming together nicely. I feel like it's coming together nicely way before the last five minutes before it's due. Um, and that's a wonderful thing. That is a wonderful thing. So have a good week and see you all next Monday at 6 p.m. Same time, same place, wherever that may be. All right, Thanks, good everybody. night. Thank night, you, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. All right. All right. Thank you.